Hi, everyone, and welcome to another 40 Method user group meeting. Again, this is the 40 in Wakanda user group. Uh, today's date is April 25th, 2018. And on our agenda today, we're going to uh, discuss a little bit about 4D method again for our newcomers. Uh, we'll get the 4D news from Jim Sobchek and Brian Young. Uh, we'll have a little 4D summit recap, uh, which recently happened in Washington, D.C. and in Paris. Uh, we'll get the news from Wakanda from Ricardo Mello. And we'll get uh, the 4D iNug e-digest from our own Edgar Hammond. And I'll do a segment called What the Blog. And then we'll have our special topic for this meeting uh, titled 4D with a Zojo web app front end uh, by a, a friend of the show, John Bachman. Um, we'll have our questions and answers and talk about uh, the next meeting, which is on June 27th of this year. So again, my name is Brent Raymond. I organize the 4D Method 4D in Wakanda user group. Uh, you can see our website where we have uh, a lot of good relevant content and recordings of all the meetings, which we'll mention in here in just a second at 4dmethod.com. Uh, it can be reached at 4dmethod at gmail.com. Our goal is to bring together a scattered community of developers and users. Uh, we stream all the meetings as we are now via YouTube Live to allow people to participate from anywhere in the world. Uh, all of our meetings are recorded. So we're, we're on, I believe, number 31 of the meetings, uh, going back almost five years. Um, so uh, a lot of terrific content in there. Uh, so you can, you can go back and review the presentations that have been uh, uh, shared with us in the past. And our intent is to try to provide fresh new content and exposure uh, for all users and developers of 4D and Wakanda out there in the world and, and show off some of the great work that, that we're doing and, uh, and the terrific applications that we're all using uh, on the web and otherwise with 4D. Um, a little uh, uh, coming back to the, uh, the, the poll that we did on the website, uh, we, we had mentioned that uh, amazing uh, coincidence that uh, some of the, the previous uh, products out of 4D, um, first version of 4D being Silver Surfer, and then uh, 4D itself, uh, and, and now Wakanda. Uh, we were wondering who the Marvel fan is at 4D, and which character is next? Uh, so uh, it looks like Beast won, uh, but uh, got a couple of other votes there. Perhaps um, instead of uh, the, the product name, we'll start naming versions uh, like like Mac does, yeah. Sierra, High Sierra. And uh, I think uh, I would nominate Beast for V17, which we'll, we'll get to later. So um, now I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Jim and Brian in San Jose to talk a little bit about news from 4D, uh, which it, there is a ton of. We'll, uh, we'll try and uh, keep, keep it short for the meeting. Uh, but uh, we do have a lot to talk about uh, in this uh, user group meeting. So thanks, guys. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, hi, Brian. Hi. How are you? Thanks, Brian. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll try to keep it short today. It looks like a long meeting. So uh, welcome uh, again from the 40 offices here in, in Silicon Valley, heart of Silicon Valley. As always, our thanks to Brent and Ed for uh, organizing these meetings and for inviting us and the Wakanda team to participate. Uh, we're looking forward to John's presentation. Uh, it should be really interesting. Uh, here in the office in, in uh, San Jose, we're still glowing uh, really in the aftermath of the of the 40 summits in Paris and Washington, DC. Uh, you may have read on the website that the uh, we set records for the total attendance of uh, both summits together. So thank you to all of those who are in the meeting and attended. Uh, it was actually an outrageous week. We had a great time. And we know it's difficult for, for you guys to get away and women to get away uh, from your 40 programming and businesses. So uh, thanks. We, we hope you found it all worthwhile. Um, one thing, we didn't get a chance to uh, directly uh, thank the speakers. Uh, we typically do that at the end of the Q&A, uh, but we didn't have one this year, a little bit different. So I did want to thank uh, all the speakers who presented at the, set, at the summit, um, both external speakers 
and the internal uh, 4D staff. I know uh, I've done sessions before, as all of us here have. So it's a lot of work to prepare and to deliver those sessions. So thanks again. That was really the highlight of the summit. And uh, I did want to thank uh, in this meeting uh, the entire global 4D staff for for who put it all together. Um, especially people who are in this room here. Uh, we didn't have a chance to do that at the summit, so I think it came off really well. Uh, Tim Nevels, if you're in the meeting, uh, or if you're not, if you watch this later, thanks for your, your well-written wrap-up on the INUG. Maybe Ed will uh, mention that later. Uh, that was really uh, awesome. Uh, I passed that around to the 40 management team, and everyone was really impressed with the, the way you grasped all the particulars of the, uh, of the summit. So uh, thanks to you for that and to everyone who contributed to that thread. Uh, so right now we're uh, what? Oh, okay. So right now we're we're looking for a venue for the 2020 summit. Uh, yeah, we have to do that two years in advance. So we pretty much have to book something down by uh, May, and we're looking for uh, for that. We're also looking for uh, 2019 World Tour event sites. We're not going to be doing what I said we would be doing at the keynote. We're not going to go to Cancun. We're not going to probably go to Alaska, uh, Las Vegas maybe. So anyway. Uh, Brian's going to talk more about the summit uh, in his piece there. Um, finally, I just wanted to to, um, to announce a couple new releases that came out today. Uh, 16.3 Hotfix 3 came out today, just this morning. So that's available on the 40, uh, 40 Forum site. And then also 15.6, which will be the last dot release of version 15. Um, you may have read on our website that we will be ending sales and support of version 15 at the end of this month, which is next week. So um, if you need additional expansions for your 40 V15 uh, installations, now is the time to contact your sales rep for that. So that's all I have, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. And uh, uh, Brent has a lot to talk about about the summit because we're we're all here about 40 content, but um, I just wanted to say we had a great year, a great location, and more than anything, fantastic content. And I know it is hard for summit attendees to go to every session they want to go to. Um, there's always a conflict or three. So uh, we are getting the videos prepared as quickly as possible so that you can see the sessions that you missed if you were at the summit. Uh, those videos will be the best we've had uh, in the years I've been here. They're, they're produced very well, very clear. And I thank everybody for their uh, amusing me to use the microphone when they ask questions. Uh, we're going to get those out starting next week in large batches and get them out sooner than we've ever gotten them out before. And on top of that, uh, come the uh, later in the year, everybody who's a partner will also have access to all the summit videos. And there is a lot for us to learn, relearn, and uh, and um, get down the the new patterns and the new things. So, Brent, uh, I'm going to hand it back to you, and uh, okay. you can talk a little bit about about that content. Great, Great. thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Um, um, Gemma, Gemma, that's a little bit disappointing. disappointing. I, there, there were some great prices to Tenerife. Uh, and uh, I, was, I was hoping that the, the road show would be there. Darn it. <laughs> Guess we'll have to uh, settle for Schaumburg. <laughs> but no, it's, uh, that's always a, a good event to go to. And uh, certainly with all the new content coming out uh, and, and such a torrent, uh, it'll be very important to attend it next year. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, coming back to um, the... Uh, the summit. Uh, oh, and, and Brian, that's great about the, the videos. Uh, I was just wondering, um, could you let us know if the advanced training day is going to be available in video as well? As well? Uh, yeah, we're working out the details on that. Um, anybody who purchased and attended the advanced training will get the videos and they're going to be a nice reference in that you'll have the slides and the the video um, with chapter markers so you can jump directly to uh, that particular slide and hear the uh, JPR's explanation of that specific topic. Um, I can't tell you when those will be available but we do intend to get those out to all attendees. And that is wonderful because that was a uh, we'll get to that again here in a minute but um, uh, that was just a, a ton of material uh, that was presented there and just uh, over 100 pages in, in the white paper. So, um, But we'll talk about that in a minute. I uh, just wanted to mention, uh, again, it was great seeing everyone at the, at the summit in D.C. 
unfortunately didn't get to attend uh, the Paris Summit, which I'm sure uh, uh, was spectacular, uh, equally as spectacular as our night out at the uh, the museum. Uh, I've heard the Eiffel Tower is also a uh, uh, nominal, nice, can, can be a, a nice place to visit where they had their 4D night. Um, picked the wrong year to skip Paris, apparently. Uh, but, uh, but no, uh, we had a great night out with the, uh, the, at, with everyone at the museum, uh, with the really wonderful views of the city. As you can see, it's overlooking the capital there. Always fun to have, um, uh, the nights out after, uh, uh, give our brains a rest after soaking in all the new materials that were presented at the summit. Um, which we'll just get to right away so that we can have some time for uh, Ricardo uh, before he has to step out. But the big, uh, big new uh, talk, uh, big new release, the uh, uh, biggest new thing in Orda, I, as you can see, I'm not even certain where to start with this because it's, it's so big. Um, but, uh, it's, it's Orda that was, uh, unveiled at the, uh, at the summits this year, uh, not to be confused with new Orda, uh, which is, uh, eighties uh, and nineties techno, um, it, blue Monday is quite good, but it's not, nothing compared to Orda, um, which is object relational database access. Um, it's new in V17. It's, uh, however, not terribly new in the engine itself. It's actually been in active development in the core uh, since uh, V11, very early on in the current uh, uh, release sort of uh, cycle, uh, uh, bunch of upgrades. Um, it was pre previously exposed only via Wakanda, uh, which any of us who have uh, some experience accessing the data store in Wakanda will find it uh, to be very familiar to, to that, which is r really excellent. Um, it's very JavaScript-like. Uh, it has its differences, but you know they, they, they developed the language with the intent that it would be uh, as close to JavaScript uh, uh, as possible um, within the 4D language environment. Uh, with Orda, the and, and this is kind of a, a, a crazy statement, the entire database becomes an object. Uh, namely, it's uh, the letters DS. You just start with DS, dot, then a table name, dot, and then uh, there's member functions and, and, and the world's your oyster from there on out. Um, and, and don't forget the flip side of that, every object becomes a database. Right, I know, mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, but no, it, it's pretty pretty wild that uh, it will also make it very uh, easy and transparent to use other external data stores, uh, so you can you can truly operate in a, in a remote fashion without changing the language that you use. Um, right, so you're able to use selections as local variables. Uh, the results of queries basically just go into a variable, which is a reference uh, to that selection. And you can have uh, a collection of, of query results. Uh, it, it's, uh, you can have any number of uh, user selections or any kind of selections. They're all just local variables uh, stored as references. And, and not only that, they can be passed from method to method uh and uh and and it really opens up whole new ways of of coding in 40 and accessing the data the data store uh which was always a real strength of of 40 even before orda um it opens the door to very easily navigate recursive relations using dot notation uh that was a big demo where you you had a table of employees where you could find your manager's manager and give them a call and say what a good job your manager is doing. Um, you can uh, navigate very easily named relations. So each of the relations uh, currently have the capability to give it a name, but um, mostly that was just to, uh, to give them uh, names. I don't know, cute names, funny names, but now they're actually useful because you can uh, indicate which relation 
uh, that you want to traverse to get to your data. So you, it opens the door to having a uh, whole bunches of uh, complex relations drawn and you just uh, uh, indicate which one that you want to use. Again, it's very similar to the Wakanda style data access. Again, um, just like 4D has been really terrific with in the past, uh, all the classic language, which effectively is all language, all code written in 4D currently is now classic, uh, is still supported and, and will be into the future, uh, again, as it has been for 30 years. Um, there's uh, <clears throat> there's Orta, new, new ways of handling record locking, optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, which uh, all of the documentation goes into very well. Uh, and the, one of the, the biggest advantages of, of diving right into Orta is that given its familiarity and, uh, and how, how, um, how it looks and feels so much like JavaScript and modern code design, it, it'll make uh, recruitment easier and it'll make uh, uh, onboard, onboarding and ramping up new developers and new projects in 4D uh, much faster. So, you know, I, I just can't say enough about Orta. It's, uh, um, it took me about a week after the summit and then a week after reading uh, the documentation that I got at the summit to wrap my head around what such a big change it is. And uh, um, we're gonna see some, some really exciting stuff uh, being developed in 4D uh, with Orta, leveraging the, the new powers of Orta in the in the coming years. So, very very interesting stuff. Um, and that was not it. Uh, there were uh, a couple of other big unveils at the summit. Uh, 4D for iOS, uh, great new updates to 4D Write Pro, and then in V18, uh, they'll be rolling out uh, source control. Uh, which again, perhaps is going to be integrated in the same uh, similar manner to Wakanda. I don't know, they didn't say exactly if we'd be using Git, but hey, why wouldn't you? So um, so just digging in a little bit on the 4D for iOS, uh, it's, a, it's fully 4D, you're developing, doing all of your primary development in 4D uh, using the component uh, 4D for iOS it generates pure Swift into an, an open coded solution. Uh, you can open up the Xcode project that it generates and, uh, and do whatever uh, additional manipulations or um, tweaks of the, the project that you would like. Uh, it creates a, a native iOS app directly out of the 4D development environment. And um, it comes uh, out of the box with attractive templates uh, for, for common interfaces that, you know, there, there's, there's not a whole lot of variety. I mean, maybe I'm, uh, I'm minimalizing it, but uh, you can do a lot with basic interfaces in an uh, iOS app or any of the, uh, the, the standard uh, native applications. Uh, and, uh, and the code can also be used uh, in an offline mode so that you can have cached data uh, within the app uh, to access even when you're not online. So just the uh, just uh, being born and being announced in this summit, but I understand that um, that given its reception and, and the excitement uh, that it generated, it's going to have a lot of, uh, it's going to have a big development push uh, for 40 I 40 for iOS, uh, which will really open up some new uh, venues of development for developers and, uh, and, and create a faster path for uh, users of 40 applications to, uh, to access their data um, away, from, uh, away from desktop computers. So um, yeah, so that's 40 for iOS. Then we have the advanced training, a whole day a marathon of new information uh, of how to use um, the new language that's being released with uh, V17. Uh, topics included understanding objects, like no really understanding objects and how that you should be using them. Uh, understanding collections, the, the new data store, data classes, entities, which are kind of a new name for a record. 
uh, but not necessarily a record. Um, relational attributes, as we mentioned earlier, naming relations and treating them as attributes to uh, your data store objects, data classes. <clears throat> um, new approaches to you, to working with forms, including a completely dynamically generated form from JSON, uh, and and all new ways of uh, of pushing in an object, uh, in and out uh, objects of data to show in a form. Uh, sh new capabilities with sharing using storage. Semaphores are basically out out the window now. Uh, there's new ways to do things, new better ways to do that, you know, sharing data between processes uh, in your application. Um, handling references, uh, multi-user and record locking, member functions, and on and on and on. I mean, I just uh, can't say enough about how much new material was, uh, was discussed in that day. And I, I, for one, will be very happy that there is a recording of it because it's going to be a uh, it's going to be very important for developers to uh, to completely wrap their head around uh, the new capabilities with V17. Uh, it's just there's so many new game changing features out there. It's uh, it's hard to keep track of. So uh, that's wonderful that we'll be having videos of the the breakout sessions and especially the advanced training. I mean, that's that's going to be cool. So um, yeah, so if we uh, looks like we got a few more minutes for you, R Ricardo. I'm going to kick it over to Wakanda before you have to uh, have have your meeting there. Um, Ricardo is the the, yes. the the chief commercial officer at Wakanda. Well, all right. Brent, perfect time. Thank you. Yeah. Well, first, congratulations to the 4D team and for the US event. I, I heard amazing things about it. <clears throat> and uh, for this giving to the community not only amazing futures, but, but also pushing development further for the current users. As, as said, Brent, very wisely, uh, it will attract new talents to this, to, to this platform. So and the follow up is, will be that we have go, uh, good news also coming from everywhere because uh, Wakanda is about to release the, release the 2.5 version um, with um, uh, um, uh, new features that will help the build a solution from the, the studio. We have also HTTPS forward secrecy, especially in cryptography, forward secrecy is, is the way that people are moving um, ahead because it um, it protects past sessions against future compromise of secret keys and passwords. So it's quite an important um, uh, little feature there. We have also uh, adding support restrict events for the connector. So if you have done a SaaS type of um, infrastructure and you're using the restrict events in Wakanda, you'll be able to apply that to the connectors and connect to other databases and use the same type of infrastructure, uh, which is it's major. Um, we also have the, the, the data browser, a new data browser coming on the version 2.6, and uh, we are finishing the Oracle connector, native connector, so you don't, you, you, you will be able to connect to, without the ODBC, you do a um, uh, straight uh, connection. Also, as in, in a good news um, uh, vibe, we saw the largest um, uh, system for Wakanda to date. Uh, it's going to impact the school district in Texas. And it has a bunch of apps that combine together with an iPad type of solution that will be implemented in buses around the school district. So it's a major system that will be done um, completely with the Wakanda ecosystem. And uh, just to finish, uh, to position, because as you can see, um, 4D and Wakanda are blending in some ways and, and, and uh, with, with uh, styles coming to both sides. I want to just um, a point that um, Wakanda is distinguished itself by the hybrid development, of course, so you can develop for Android and iOS and, and, and 
and do that all in JavaScript, right? Use the framework that you want. And you also can get native development and React uh, native. And also the factor that uh, scalability is a, it's, uh, it's with the session management and everything. So we are not um, uh, fighting in that, uh, in that sense in our heads. And we are very glad that um, uh, 4D has now a solution for the, the, the mobile with iOS, which will, which will give a lot of um, um, uh, possibilities for the, um, uh, the community. So that's all I got for now. And I'm um, sorry I have to leave early today. I have a meeting starting in like five minutes. So, okay. Yeah, thanks. That was a, that was a great recap. You know, I, I think that, um, that the new features, personally, I think uh, the new features in 4D uh, will probably uh, uh, attract developers and, and inter give them a, an easier introduction into coding in Wakanda because, <clears throat> um, you know, it's uh, it, it, the way of coding becomes very similar between the two now. Uh, and there's some very attractive features to the uh, Wakanda data store that are now being uh, rolled out into the 4D environment. So I think uh, it'll make it easier for 4D developers at least to, uh, to jump between the two and uh, also open up a new avenue for, uh, for, for, for new developers to, uh, to learn 4D and Wakanda. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Brent. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ricardo. And now we have the iNug eDigest from Ed Hammond. Thanks, Brent. Yeah, it's interesting. I uh, I save all the di the digests and go through them uh, before uh, we do our presentations. I mark them as I read them, and then go back and assemble uh, my summaries later on and. It's amazing how much discussion prior to the summit is, is just not relevant anymore. <laughs> um, and with that note, I'll do the uh, uh, summarize the two threads I thought were particularly interesting, uh, very rich, lengthy threads. First one was started by uh, Keith Goebel. And he was asking, uh, 4D data on the web, what do you use? Uh, if you follow my Nabble links, which will be on the website uh, later today, uh, it's divided up into two threads by Nabble. Um, it's a discussion of a wide range of possibilities for connecting uh, a web front, end, web front end to 4D data, including what will be our feature presentation today. So the discussion includes uh, design decisions, uh, data access, uh, REST APIs, uh, front ending uh, through Apache or Nginx, uh, editing tools and IDEs, um, and actually led to a side discussion on business practices and how a government and large businesses can force changes within an industry and make it hard, if not impossible, for a small developer to complete having been an independent consultant for 30 years before I joined the Art Institute, uh, I found that uh, particularly uh, uh, interesting and annoying uh, uh, subject to discuss. But uh, those are, uh, that, that is a, a very meaty thread, and if you're doing any uh, 4D on the web or thinking about it, uh, it'd be a good idea to go back and review that. Uh, the second uh, thread, uh, was alluded to earlier by Jim, and it was uh, Tim Neville's uh, Summit 2018 comments. Uh, Tim uh, obviously was paying attention during the summit and uh, thought about it very well and did a good summary, but it led to a lot of further discussion. Um, there was uh, speculation and questions from those who are not in attendance. Uh, so you got to flesh out a few of the things that he mentioned in his original comments. Um, how does the new way of doing things differ from a classic 4D way or from uh, using SQL views, et cetera? And I'll leave the details uh, for those who are willing to go back and read the abundant thread and the discussions uh, soon to come here. Um, personally, I thought the... Uh, um, the atmosphere at the summit was extremely positive. Uh, I've been to uh, a number of them over the last 15 or so years, 
and it uh, it was one of the most positive summits that I can remember ever attending. Uh, of course, it hap it's uh, always good to see uh, old friends and, and and make new friends at the summit and put faces uh, together with names. And hopefully, I haven't mangled anybody's name too bad. Uh, and with that in mind, and with all the content still yet to cover, I think that would wrap it up for me, Brent. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Yeah, and um, just to mention that again, I mean, there's just been uh, a, a lot of so much great content coming out of 4D and so much great discussion on the NUG about it uh, and uh, people people working through their own scenarios about how uh, how to approach uh, integration of the new functionality and how to take advantage of uh, the new features. So check it out and check out the links that uh, Ed keeps up on, on the 4D method site under the e-digest tab. And um, right, we'll, uh, we'll kick on down to the next section here, which uh, is aptly named, What the Blog? Um, the blog is, uh, has been very active since the summit. Uh, in, in fact, it's got a whole series of new Orta-related uh, topics, including how Orta will change the way you work. And uh, it's clearly evident that it will change it. <laughs> uh, query your database with an object-oriented approach. CRUD data, create, update, and delete data with uh, Orta. Uh, going back and forth between current selections in Orta, work with objects and collections, locking entities with Orta. Uh, it's uh, it is it is the the topic uh, that everyone here should be probably investigating and see um, seeing how they can take advantage of it. And the blog is a great place to start. Each each one of these articles comes with a, a nice write up and uh, demo databases. So. Um, in addition to uh, the Orta series, we also have uh, Get Ready for GDPR with 4D. Uh, if you're not familiar with GDPR, uh, perhaps you're not doing business in Europe because it, is, uh, it has become a huge, uh, to the scale I've heard it compared to uh, year 2000, uh, a, a huge change to data systems uh, is... It, it, with, in relevance to uh, uh, um, privacy laws and 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 ha what kind of data that you're able to store and share and use uh, about people accessing your systems, uh, and given that we are largely all involved in in data systems and information uh, related to people in some regard, um, it's uh, it would be good. To, it's a good blog article to get updated on. In fact, we're we're looking at perhaps having um, a session or, or two, a uh, a user group discussion about GDPR because it is um, it's a minefield to navigate uh, and and to prepare for, and it's coming very quickly. In fact, on May twenty fifth uh, is is its start date, and uh, and companies need to be ready right away. So. Anyways, obviously, a lot to discuss there. Check out the article on it. Um, and then a, another blog article on, on new language for, for basic syntax in any programming language, loops. Uh, so there's, there's a whole several new uh, ways of writing for and while loops in 4D uh, to make it easier, make it more possible to work with collections and... Uh, and in order and in the new uh, in the new paradigm that we're having in, in the language <laughs> to, to use uh, my favorite uh, double speak <laughs> so anyways um, a lot to find on the blog uh, check it out it's great blog and the knowledge base both offer a, a gold mine of uh, information if uh, if you're in this business so check it out and uh, so now I'd like to, to welcome back to 4D Method, uh, John Bachman. He's joining us again from Hawaii. Uh, you, may, you may remember his uh, concerto number one on November 15th of last year uh, at, at 4D Method, where he, uh, 
He was in uh, number 28, uh, making client server workers work. Uh, it was a veritable symphony in four-part harmony of worker processes remotely monitoring the server data updates and use of call form to update dashboards. Uh, and he also gave a rendition of his composition at the recent 4D Summit in DC. Um, here, uh, he is here to, uh, to share with us uh, one of his uh, recent compositions with instrumentation from 4D and Zojo. Uh, if you're not familiar, familiar with Zojo, uh, there's some great, uh, great uh, demo videos on their website, uh, but um, he, will, uh, he will show us uh, today how to, uh, how to connect to 4D and build a web app uh, in a very short period of time. So, um, thanks, thanks for joining us, John, and uh, welcome back. And I'll hand it over to you now. Okay, let me see if I can get the screen sharing going here. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. Do you see my screen? I think you do. Yes. Is it blue? Yeah, it's blue. That's good. Okay. See the first slide? Yep. All right. Hi, uh, again, my name is John Bachman. Uh, I'm out of Hawaii. And by the way, if you're looking for a venue for the next conference, uh, the next summit, uh, Hawaii is always waiting. Uh, we've got a great convention center. It's uh, steps away from Waikiki and the beach. The only problem would be, I don't know how many of the attendees would actually be at the conference. Uh, well, well, I will push for it personally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we go all over the country. Why not Hawaii? Um, but anyways, uh, let's jump into what we're going to do today. I'm going to try to show you uh, the Zojo IDE and then how to integrate it with 4D. Uh, but first, a quick quick rundown of how I got started with Zojo. Back in 2011, uh, a, a fellow developer here in Hawaii, Tony Hall, had a, a consult, was a consultant for Hawaii Academy of Science. Uh, he got a job with the University of Hawaii and uh, had to give up that consultancy. Uh, asked me to take it over, and uh, I, I went ahead and took it over. I was a little reluctant at the time, but I'm sure glad I did. Uh, they run the State Hawaii uh, Science and Engineering Fair, uh, deal with hundreds of students every year in Hawaii that go on to the International Fair. Uh, it's quite a project, and they've been doing it for years and years, and uh, it's been a real joy for me to work with them. Um, anyways, uh, when I got the, the, the database, uh, it had a web app for judges online registration where the judges could come in and register for the, for the fair. Uh, Tony had subcontracted David Adams to write the, the, the uh, web app. And at the time, David was real high on Flex and Flash. Um, I remember him telling me all about Flex back then. So he had written the, uh, the web app for the judges registration in Flex. Shortly after I got it, uh, the Academy asked me to do a second web app for student online registration. And so I went ahead and looked at David's stuff and cop basically copied it, copied all of his stuff and uh, the Flex project and then just changed it for the student. Uh, and it, it, worked, uh, it worked pretty well. Let me do something here, make it a little easier for me. Uh, in the code, David basically used his web core code, uh, which he developed and published back in 2001 for the book, The 4D Web Companion. Some of you may remember that. Uh, and that, that basic code is what he used on the 4D side. Uh, it's great stuff. Um, I'm actually continuing to use it uh, to this day. I think I've got slides out of order here. Uh, and it basically a black box to me, uh, and I just use it to, to connect to any outside uh, website. So then in about the same time that I got this, and got, got my student registration done, uh, Apple dropped their support for Flash, which sent a lot of us running for the hills. Um, actually, Flex continues to live on today as Apache Flex. Uh, I learned that in preparing for this uh, presentation. Um, and but at the time, that I didn't know that was going to happen, so I went looking for another uh, venue to, to uh, do my web apps. In fact, I wanted to convert all of the two that I had to something else. And that's when I kind of fell into Zojo. 
saw the, uh, downloaded a couple of their examples and kind of liked it and jumped into it. Um, that was supposed to be the slide before, apologize. That's uh, where I wanted to say that I continue to use his code to this day with very little modification. Um, so a little bit of history on Zojo real quick. A lot of you may remember a 40 developer named Jeff Perlman. Uh, he was a developer back in the nine, early 90s, probably started prior to the 90s in the 80s sometime, late 80s. Uh, uh, Jeff even wrote a book in 1993 called Inside Fourth Dimension. It's still available online uh, at Amazon for about 15 bucks if you want to see how, how we programmed back then. Uh, in 1997, Jeff started uh, looking a little beyond fourth dimension. He wanted his own uh, uh, development platform. And so he went ahead and bought Cross, -plas cross Basic. Cross Basic uh, was a cross, was cross platform in the sense that it was cross between Mac and Java Virtual Machine. Then in 1998, he changed the name to Real Basic. That was due to a trademark uh, con conflict with Cross Basic, so he just changed it to Real Basic. And that, this is where I first saw Real Basic was in 1998. I was consulting out in, in San Jose for a company out there, and I would uh, join the San Jose 4D Users Group meeting that met over at the Apple campus. Um, and he presented the first video conference I ever saw uh, in 98. Uh, and uh, it was on Real Basic, and it's pretty interesting, but it was in, in its infancy at the time, uh, and I kind of forgot about it after that. In 2010, the name was changed to Real Studio, and that was because he wanted to get away from anybody thinking it had anything in relation to the original Basic. It is fully object-oriented, as you'll see. Uh, it, uh, it's not the original Basic. Uh, I, more, I guess, Visual Basic became uh, uh, object-oriented as well. In 2013, changed the name to Zojo. I don't know what the name means or where it came from. Uh, I didn't take any time to find out, but uh, that's what it is, and that's where we are today with Zojo. Okay. Uh, over that period of time, the uh, Zojo started off as a cross-platform between Mac OS and Java, Java Virtual Machine, and uh, and they dropped Java and added Windows. The implementation at first was really bad on Windows. Uh, apparently, uh, it, uh, it got better, but at the start, it was not very good at all. Then they added Linux support. Uh, then they added the web support, which was about was several years ago, uh, to create web apps. And then a couple of years ago, they added the iOS support. The iOS support is much like in 4D that we've had so far. Usually, you can start it, uh, uh, but you're going to end up in Xcode. Uh, and I, going forward, hopefully, with what we got coming down the pike, uh, that will be better uh, as we go along. But as far as Zojo goes, it's not really, for, to me, it's not really a player. I'll just go straight to uh, Xcode to do my work. And then finally, they added Raspberry Pi this, this last year. Okay. All right, what is Zojo really then? It's, uh, it's an object-oriented, cross-platform, rapid development tool for creating apps for the desktop, the web, iOS, and Pi. We're going to concentrate on the website. The web, web part. Uh, it's definitely object oriented. It's actually a good place to learn object oriented programming, I think. In fact, I'm not very good, wasn't very knowledgeable before I started using Zojo, and now I think I know quite a bit more. Uh, if you don't know object, anything about uh, OOP, uh, it's a really good place to, uh, to learn. Uh, it's definitely cross platform, as you can see, and rapid development, absolutely. Uh, recently, I was asked to create something for Queen's Hospital. And I created a front end to 4D in two weeks. It, it was really, really fast, uh, uh, the development. We're going to create something today. OK. It's free to download. You can uh, build, uh, and you're, sorry, you can uh, create any of the uh, web apps, iOS or Pi or desktop for free. The only thing you can't do is deploy it. Uh, if you want to deploy it, you're going to have to buy licenses. There's basically three licenses, uh, desktop, web, and iOS. If you buy them individually, they're 300 bucks. Uh, <clears throat> Raspberry Pi is not here because you're probably not going to deploy on Pi. If you want, you can go pro, buy all three licenses at the same time for about a $200 discount, about 700 bucks, includes all three. Uh, 
enterprise. I don't know why anybody would pay a thousand dollars for additional support every year, but uh, that's it. That's there if you want it. Uh, they get a couple of code reviews with that, some other extras. The licenses are good for updates for one year, uh, and every, uh, if you don't update, your license is good forever, just without the updates. Uh, any renewals are at full price. Okay, I'm going pretty fast here because I got a lot to cover. Uh, we're going to jump into the demo now. The um, I've uh, there the Zojo project that I'm going to put together, plus that's that's uh, got a lot more than what I'm going to show you today, and the 4D database that I'm using is uh, I give them to Brent <clears throat> and you can download it later on but if you have to leave earlier uh, it, it'll be available and of course you can come back and look at the video uh, that he has posted so let's jump into the uh, <clears throat> into the, the demo the the, uh, the demo code is available already on the, uh, the the 40 method post okay all right so uh, I've already got Zojo running um, so Zojo is running, uh, and I'm going to just start off by creating a new project. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> this window is what you're going to get every time you open open up Zojo. I have several projects that I'm already that I've already done, uh, and that's what it'll show you. And you can just double click and get your project up again. Uh, it comes out of the box with a bunch of examples, uh, and if, for example, in the web examples, there are many. Uh, projects that will show you uh, how to do things. It, it's really pretty good. Uh, you can also download templates from third parties. Uh, these are three that I downloaded to learn how to do certain things that I, weren't, weren't in the examples. Um, now this is where we create the, the, uh, the application. Uh, and I just want to point out that at this point we're creating an application type, not a platform. It's not when we build is when it'll be decided which platform it goes to. Of course, iOS uh, obviously is already defined as being for iPhone or iPad, but these three could be for the desktop, uh, could be for a Windows machine, a Mac, Mac, Linux, any of these three. So I'm going to create a web app, uh, give it a name, call it Zojo underscore demo. And this project uh, without the underscore is what's uploaded for you guys, uh, completely done. Uh, you put your company name in, uh, in preferences, I already have mine, and it automatically creates the uh, application identifier for you here. You can edit it if you want, but if, but if you uh, add to it, it will create. Everybody see that okay, I hope. Um, so, of course, the application identifier is if you were to post this up or deploy it out to one of the web app, one of, one of the app stores. Okay, so all I'm going to do now is click OK, and what happens? is it creates a web app. When I say it creates a web app, I mean it's created a web app. We now have a fully functional web app. All of the HTML behind it to create it is done. Uh, and if I run it, which we have up here a run button, Safari opens. And notice the title here is untitled because we didn't do anything and there's nothing in the window, but it's run. That's it. We have a web app. Uh, if I go back to Sojo, the, uh, the name of the, the, the form that we opened up is untitled, and that's what we saw. OK, let's do a quick rundown of, of the overall ID. But before I do, let's talk in general about build, uh, because that'll help you understand what we're doing uh, later. Uh, when we go down here to the build section, down here, uh, we have the different build uh, options, Mac OS, Windows, Linux. They have a cloud that you can upload to uh, and deploy using the deploy button to their cloud. I don't know how much it costs, but uh, you can deploy your web app to their cloud. Uh, before you do any of that, you need to uh, look at the shared uh, button here. And in this panel on the right side is called an inspector. And it has three sections. Uh, the top is a versioning section. So if you're, if you like to, ver if you want a version, it's fully got all the stuff you need for that. Stage codes, it got auto incrementing version, and so on. The bottom section down here is for debug. Anytime I hit the run button for an app, like I just did, it runs in debug mode. 
and we have to give it a port to listen on. What I want to point out here is that the port has to be obviously different than your 4D port because the web app is itself a, a web server and 4D is a web server. 4D is going to be listening in this, in this demo on port 80. You can change it around uh, and there's various ways to do this. And the web app is going to be listening as, as I have it here on 8080. So you need to make sure that they're not the same. So that's when we run debug, basically it'll run in local host and use port 8080 for the web app. 4D will be listening off over on the same machine, on the same machine on port 80. Uh, in the build section, uh, there's various things. I'm not going to go into these other buttons uh, as far as folder and included functions and so forth. What I want to concentrate on is the deployment type. Uh, in this button, there's two types, CGI and standalone. Uh, I think there's actually three types of deployment because we have the Zojo Cloud deployment, which is a, a, to me is a third type of deployment. Uh, the difference between CGI and standalone, in CGI, of course, your CGI, uh, if we were to C do a CGI with 4D, uh, 4D would be the, uh, it would be hit with the, I would be, be handling the IP request that comes in initially and then talk to the web app and then the, re the response would go back through 4D back out again. Uh, that works really well, uh, except that I don't know how to do a CGI with 4D, and so I just ignored it. I tried for a while. I couldn't figure it out. If somebody knows how, uh, maybe they can give us a presentation sometime on how to set up 4D as, uh, in a CGI pro uh, mode. Um, so what I've gone to is standalone. All right. So in standalone, um, basically 4D is running in port on, on its own port, and just like in the debug mode, we're going to give the, uh, the web app its own port. Now I'm going to use the same one I'm using for debug. Uh, this works fine, except that there's a problem in that the address then, because for if let's say the initial hit comes into 4D with an IP address of www whatever, it's listening on 80. 4D would then see that it's coming from a web app that you made, and then redirect to the to the Zojo web app at port 80, port 8080. So for what happens then is Zoji doesn't go back through 4D; it goes out. Uh, from its own web server, and, and the end user then will see the port in the address. Uh, most end users don't care, it doesn't matter, but it does create a problem if the firewall there behind uh, blocks outgoing ports. Case in point, University of Hawaii here uh, blocks on their Wi-Fi network any outgoing port that is not 80 or 8080. Um, and then when they're on, if they're on Wi-Fi at the UH, uh, the web app will not work. So what we basically tell them is, hey, uh, go home, use it at home, or go to Starbucks. That uh, works well from there. Um, so that is a disadvantage. There on Windows, if you're deploying on Windows, uh, there's I, I've already got one site doing this. You can use Windows uh, SQL Server as a proxy, and uh, and then that will be work just as if it's a CGI. It works really well. And they don't they don't see the port anymore. It just comes back with the original IP address that they had. So I've got it set up here. So what does that mean? I've got this set up now. So what I can just go to Mac OS and build. And it's building for a 64 bit. There's an option on the right over there, if you see, to choose 64 bit or 32. Now if you notice what I get is a terminal app. That's how the web app is deployed. It's deployed as a terminal app or a, a command line app in Windows. Uh, in both cases, it's the same. If I double click this, the web app opens in terminal. Okay, open in terminal. Uh, if I go to the web browser, where's my web browser? There it is. Open it up. And if I type in here local host 8080, I got it. So we've opened it up via the deploy, deployable um, terminal app. And basically, you just copy it over to wherever your server is from here. When I close this, it'll say, yeah, you want to terminate this? Yes, I do. Let's uh, go back real quick and deploy for Windows. I click to, uh, build. And this time, it's building for Windows. Again, at 64-bit. I didn't change it to 32 takes a little longer to build the Windows app for some reason. I'm not sure why. 
There we go. And what you get is an EXE. Copy these files over to your Windows server. Uh, double click the EXE and you're up and running. Uh, as long as 4D is listening and you got it connected to that, you'll, you've got a full web app talking to 4D. It's that simple. <clears throat> uh, on, you'll see a little bit, hopefully if we have time, on one of my uh, sites for the Academy specifically, I have three web apps running at the same time. All right. So let's look over all the IDE real quick. Um, the top portion is pretty obvious. This is uh, related to the overall project that we're running. Uh, we have the run button, build button, and the deploy buttons here. Uh, some help sections, feedback, and upgrade. These two are navigation buttons for this panel. As you saw earlier, I was in the, ins in the inspector when I uh, selected the shared. There's also a library over here, but uh, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, this section down here is called the navigation panel. And this section here is called the layout. This is uh, what you see is what you get, basically. And then, as we've mentioned a second ago, this section here is shared by the in an inspector and a library, an inspector and a library. Uh, OK, <clears throat> we'll get back to these here in a second. So if I go down over to the uh, navigation panel, uh, there's a filter to filter out what you're seeing in the content section below. So I've uh, filtered to just sessions. That's how that works. The jump is basically a way to jump back and forth between two things. I've double clicked session, and now I'm looking only at what's in session, but I can go back to my Zojo demo, the whole thing, and uh, jump back and forth, can do it with these buttons as well. Okay, so that's the navigation. That's the, the jump panel. We've already talked about the build settings. The contents is basically everything that you have in your website. Any, uh, all the classes, all the objects, all, all of everything, pages are listed here. And it's listed in outline form uh, uh, based on scope. So uh, these constants scope are inside the session. Anything outside of the session would not see these constants unless you uh, directly identified it through session. So the outline uh, is, is, is literally everything that's, in this case, we have only a session, only one session at a time. Every user that comes into the website will be, uh, be given a session. And uh, from there, uh, we have a web page, and that's it right now, one web page. OK. Uh, the layout, of course, is showing us what we're, what we're creating. Uh, let's go back over here to the, um, to the uh, library and the inspector. Um, if I, in the library, we have classes that are already out of the box provided for in Zojo. We have buttons, uh, pickers, uh, pop-up menus, all uh, you know, scroll bars, sidebars. Uh, there's a lot of input fields, text area, text field, URLs, pa password fields, um, decorations like rectangles and separators. Uh, indicators, progress bars, etc. Uh, controllers and viewers. We're going to work with the viewer here shortly. Um, so basically, uh, what we, we do here is we can drag a button onto the, onto the uh, window. Uh, and let's drag it to rectangle. Take this rectangle and put it here. And I got a button, and I'm going to put it there. OK, so I have a rectangle and a button. If I select. The, the whole web page and click on the inspector, it shows me the properties, not all of the properties, but many of the properties that are related to a web page. And it is super class is web page. And it's been named, the, the instance of this web page that, I, that is created is web page one. Um, there are more properties than shown here, uh, which you'll see how that works in a second and how you get at them. Um, if I click on the rectangle, the superclass is web rectangle. It's been created with the name rectangle one, which is fine. Uh, and it has some basic properties that you can set for it. If I click on the button, again, it's a web button. It's a superclass. Its instance name is button one. Okay. So if I run this right now, I should see the rectangle and the button. And I have got that 
still titled still titled um, web page I'm sorry the uh, the page is still titled web page one so I'm going to change it to Zojo demo so now we should see that Sorry, that is web page one. I think you might be. Uh, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> retitle the frame, yeah. I'm in the wrong place. I'm going to go down here. Okay, so I'm going to type it Sojo demo. And now I've changed the name. Okay, so let's do something with this real quick. I want to just talk a little bit real quick about uh, the way you can you can. Build your web apps uh, with web pages, multiple web pages, where you go from one web page to another. And I'm going to do some things here, and you, you in order for, and without describing them, show you how you would uh, uh, work certain parts of this. Okay, if if uh, I want, I can do this by creating a duplicate of this web page and have a second web page. Uh, and in the second web page, I can change this to a circle, say. And how do I change it to a circle? Okay, I'm going to use a style. I'm going to go down to web styles and create a style. Actually, what I really wanted to do first is create a folder and call it styles. So now I have a folder called styles. And I'm going to drag that style into the folder. That's where I wanted it to go. So what do I have? I have style one. So I'm going to add a property. I want to change that background on that square to red. And I'm going to make it into a circle by changing the radius of the corners. So I'm adding properties to this particular style. And Zojo is doing everything for me in the background by creating a CSS for this style. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to look at it. I've created this style. If I go back to my second web page and select the rectangle, I come down here to styles and create style one. It's a circle. If I go back to styles, I want to rechange this name and call it cir circle style. Okay. And should go back here. It should still be selected. Good. Okay, so I've got a, a circle. So now I need to get between these two. So it's pretty simple. If I go to web page one and go to my button, if I double click the button, it's basically form events, just like we have in, uh, in 4D. Uh, it automatically gives me a list of the events that, uh, that I can uh, pick for this particular class of object. Uh, and in this case, it's an action class that's equivalent to our on click event. So I'll open that up. Now, what I want to do is show web page 11. I'm going to go back here and change that to 2 to keep up with my code that I have. So now that's web page 2. Go back to the action on the button 1, and I want to show web page 2. As we know, we can only show one web page at a time. Notice that it types ahead for me, and if I tab, I see I have 1 and 2 available. So I'm going to go to 2. And if I hit dot and tab, I get a list of all the properties that are available for a web page. And what I want in particular is show. That's all there is to it. That will then show web page two. Since there's only one web page at a time being able to show, it doesn't need any more than that. Uh, if I go to the web page two and go to go to its button and put an action in, I just put in web page one Got jump. Okay. All right, let's see. That should work. Let's see what happens. Uh, okay, I've got a circ square. If I click the button, it worked. So we've basically done a quick multi page web app. All right. Uh, so at this point, 
we've got uh, two pages. The other way we could do this, which I'm going to uh, try to demonstrate real quick here, is to not use pages. And, and the way I like to work is basically I, know, I normally don't have more than two pages. Uh, one is, in some cases, only one. And I use what we would call subforms uh, in 4D. Uh, in Zojo, it's called a container. So I would, I'm going to take and copy and create a container by dragging this container over to my navigation panel. And it creates my container. I'm going to move it up above the styles. That's where I'd like to have it. And in this container, I'm going to put the rectangle. So I'm going to go to the inspector, change this one to container rectangle as a name, and go to my uh, go to the uh, web page one where the rectangle is, and just copy it rectangle and paste it. So now I've got a rectangle. Then I'm going to uh, go ahead and duplicate this. I have a second one. This one I'm going to call contact circle. Okay, so we have two containers that are instances of the web controller, web container class. Now, in the second one, uh, since it's a container circle, I need to make it a circle. So I've made it a circle. Now I have these classes, now I need to instantiate them into my web page. So what I'm going to do is go back to my web page before I start and I'm going to delete this rectangle, move this button out of the way just to get more room, take the rectangle and drop it on the web page. So I got that there. And I'm going to take the circle container and drop it on the web page. What I'm doing is making an instance of the a subclass that I already created, making a subclass of the subclass. So I have two containers. Now all I have to do, uh, at this point, I don't need web page two anymore. I'm going to delete it. And all I have to do is change the action on the button to handle uh, the two. So what I'm going to do is say container. And you, the careful, you have to be careful that you pick the right one. You need to do the, the instance that's actually on the web page. So I'm going to say, if container rectangle one is visible. And I forgot to put the if statement there, so I'm going to highlight it. And for, JoJo's got uh, some nice quick loops uh, to enter, so I'm just going to click that. And actually, I put it inside there. Take that. And... Visible, what is it? Well, if you look down at the bottom here, let's uh, see if I can get it to stay. It doesn't want to stay. Anyways, you look at the bottom. Uh, you see where it comes up? It tells me that webcontrol.visible uh, is, and that's the, down here, it is a Boolean. So I don't need anything more. It's visible. I'll put a quick else in here. So if, if rectangle one is visible, then I'm going to make it not visible if, and make rectangle. Uh, now, this one, I want the circle. So I want circle one and make it true. This and flop them. Now, the only other thing I need to do is take contact container one, circle one, make it invisible. So I go over here and make it invisible. So when it starts up, the only thing I'll see is the rectangle. So let's see if that works. Working. Okay. So that's two ways to approach your websites. Uh, if you're going to use Zojo, actually, I say in any IDE, I would think that that's available. Um, while I'm here, real quick, uh, this is the debug mode. You notice a tab opened up uh, next to the web page one. We have some controls for debug. The upper portion would show code. Uh, if it was, a, was stopped on your code, you had a break or you got an error. 
Uh, this section shows your stack uh, that you're in. Uh, and over here are the variables that, that you can look at. And so that's what happens. When I click the stop for this run, it goes back to my page. Okay. So those are the two approaches that I, that I do. Uh, the, the main way I do things, as you'll see in the, in the Zojo, in the demo that I provided, I only use one web page and I have a, uh, two containers for what's there. So let's do something more interesting. I'm going to get rid of this and get rid of this. Now, if I run this right now, watch what happens. I get a bunch of errors. Okay, so it drops right away and tells me that, hey, you've got some problems here. This item doesn't exist. Well, of course, I just deleted them. Not that Richter one's gone. So if I double click it, I can see, ah, there's my errors. I can fix them. So to fix these, I just delete them. Now it should run. No errors. Okay, so we're back. Good. So we'll close this. So if I go back to my web page one, uh, I'm going to go to my library and let's do something a little more interesting. I'm looking for a map viewer, which is right here. I'm going to drag it onto the page. Move this button up to about there. Now I've got it down to the bottom, but I want it to go to full width. And I've got this handy little um, fill width and fill uh, vertical. I'm going to click fill width and it's filled. So what do I have? I just dropped the map viewer. So what's that mean? So let's run it and see. <clears throat> ah, the Google map. So it's a fully pre pre-designed class of a Google map. Everything is there that needs to, uh, for it to work. Uh, I want to make it fill the, the page uh, if I resize the page. So if I go back to the inspector for this, I, I'm selecting the map and just use the lock buttons for the window. And now when I run it, it's full. It's going to work the way I want it. Okay. All right. So now I need a way to actually give it some direction. So go back here and I'm going to go to my library and grab a text field and put it up here and make it a little wider and move this down a bit. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to rename this button. Actually, I don't need to rename that. that. I need to, again, rename the, the, the caption and say, go to. Okay. Also, I want to make this bold. So I'm going to quickly go to my styles, add to styles, a web style. And I'm going to add a font style and call it bold and change this to bold. And you can name it any way you want, but I'm going to do that. Just there. go back to my web page, pick the button, and click bold style. I just made it bold. Okay, uh, I'm going to rename this text field to TF. So it keeps with my code that I have TF location. And now I have to put some code in here to make it work. So I double click the button and I already had created the action. It was over here already. So it just opened up and I'm going to copy some code to make this go a little quicker. Uh, this is the go to location code. So first thing I'm going to do is dim a location as an instance of web map location. Okay. How do I learn all this? Well, uh, you can go just like in 4, 4D, you can go to their, uh, language reference manual, suppose it's their uh, developer site. And if I click on this, their site opens up and I get uh, examples and uh, all the properties, methods that are associated with this particular class. Okay. Uh, so what I need to do to work is I need to create an instance of the web map location. Now that web map location, our, our instance's location has a property called API key. 
what is this? This is something for uh, Google uses to, to kind of control how many hits it gets. If you don't have an API key and you try to hit it more than a couple of times, it will stop working. Um, so Google lets you go to their website, and uh, I put a link. If you go in the, uh, in the, in the demo uh, file that I have, the project that I have, um, I put a note section. Oh, I have to add a note. And called it references. And in there will be a link to, to getting a, an API key. So, so this is the API key that I got. It also has a property called address, which we're going to need to put in. So if I were to go here and go address, address. And what I'm going to put there is the text from the TF location field that I created. And again, the TF location has a lot of properties, but what I want is text. And then finally, we need to uh, give that location instance of web map location to the viewer. Web map viewer, go to location is a property of web map viewer, and I'm passing it the location uh, object. So at this stage, let's see what happens. <clears throat> if I go here and I put my address in, And uh, for the viewer, the way it's set up right now, you don't need all this, but I went ahead. So if I click go, wow, we just did a vacation to Hawaii. So if I scroll in, we'll see that it is, it should have centered right on mine, but I, this is where I live. Right where my, my hand is right there. My house is about up in that section right there. Okay. Anyway, so that's how that works. If I were to take and change this to York. There's probably other um, properties that you can set for the zoom uh, once once you bring up the map. Right. There's all kinds of properties for this. I, I haven't looked at any of them, but that's where we are in New York. Okay. All right. So cool. We've got a site that is showing us the address. Now let's do something with 4D. So in 4D, and it's running and listening on port 80, I have a, a, a table. If I can get you to get it over here. OK. Uh, the table has four, uh, basically my family in it, and their addresses. OK. Uh, full name, address, city, and state, and zip. All right, so I need some way of displaying that here. So I'm going to go to my library and grab a list box. There it is there. Now, you can drag it over or you can just double click it and it'll bring it over. I'm going to put it right about here. And I want about, I want to be able to see four, see how well that works. I'm going to drag this down so they don't overlap. That should work pretty good. Actually, I want this down a little bit more. That's to still work. Let's see what we got. So I'm going to go ahead and run it. That's good enough. Good enough. Okay. Now I'm going to just bring over, even though I have all this other information for the demo, in the actual demo, in the actual demo project that you get, uh, there is functionality to uh, edit and add, and so it downloads the other fields. But all I'm going to download for this part is the full name and the address, and a full uh, concatenated address to it. Uh, so I need two columns in this list box. So I go to the inspector, and I'm going to rename the list box to LB, list box, contacts. It's, a, it's an instance of the superclass web list box, as you can see. Um, I don't need to do anything with the locking. It's fine the way it is. And but when I roll down here to column count, I'm going to make two. It's zero base, so column one is zero, column two is one. And I only want one 
column to show. The other one, I, I really don't care about the, the address column. I only want the full name. Uh, you can make it there. There uh, with code, you can make them invisible, the columns. But I'm going to do it just by uh, making the column widths uh, work for me. So I have two columns. Uh, if you look up here, the the list box itself is 200 pixels wide. So for column one, I'm going to make it 200, and for column two, I'm going to make it one. Okay. Now uh, I think I want to make this bold and centered for the, uh, so I'm going to just go ahead and create another style. Uh, Got to add a style, add a web style. And so I just go ahead and add a property for style, bold, add another property for alignment, centered, uh, name this bold, centered. Okay, go back to my web page. Pick my column, and down here at the bottom, I have a header style option, and I'll pick bold center. It won't show here; it'll only show when we when we actually uh, run it. Uh, okay, so so far so good. Now I need to rename the, the the column header here. So if you look here, there's a little button that shows up, uh, and you click on it, and it shows you the column headers. You can actually have more than one header. I don't know exactly; I haven't used that, but if I just click here, I can just say contacts. I'm going to go ahead and click over here and make it address. Okay, now I don't want to do that. I don't want more than one header. I don't know how that works or why it's there. Okay, so now it's called contacts. Let's run this real quick and see if it looks okay. <clears throat> sure. Bold and centered. Uh, that doesn't look too bold over there, but that's okay. We'll let that go for now. So we've got it set up with one column. All right. So what do we need to do next? We need to talk to 4D to get this filled. So when am I going to fill this? Well, obviously, I could fill it at any time, uh, but the obvious time is when the web page first opens. So if I go to the web page over here, right-click and add to the web page, I want to add an event handler. And the one I want is open, which, because I have no other events selected, the first one you're ever going to need is probably open, so it goes ahead and suggests it. Tells you what it's going to do. Basically, open uh, runs this code before the web page is actually sent to the browser. So this is perfect. So I've got that. I have to make this quicker. I'm going to copy the request code over here. And so let's go through this. So real quick. Uh, this is me. This is what the way I do things. Uh, the host is basically the 4D uh, address. Where where is 4D? Um, I usually use a global global uh, variable for this and set it uh, for the whole entire database, so I don't have to keep doing this. But for this representation, uh, I'm going to apply local host to that. It could be www.mycoolwebsite.com. Uh, or it could just be mycoolwebsite.com. The get uh, is for where I put some keywords that I use in 4D to, to tell it a couple of things. Uh, this get is added to the URL that I send. Uh, this tells it what format do I want the response in. And if it's XML, that's fine. I'll get it in XML. If it's JSON, I can get it in JSON, and I can handle both. I'll show you that in a minute. I'm going to leave it as JSON for now. Uh, the site uh, tells 4D that this is coming from the Zojo website. Uh, I share some of the methods in 4D with uh, normal 4D operations and uh, views and so forth. Uh, so uh, the method needs to know whether to send that XML or just get the records that it's asking for. So Zojo tells it that, hey, this is coming from Zojo. The next thing we need to do is actually create a socket for it to get out on, and it, and it has a whole class of HTTP socket, which you can go to for for um, uh, information. And I create an instance of that HTTP socket as a socket one. Then I'm going to create a data string to, to receive the, uh, the information which the socket will return uh, from 4D. And 
I can use get or post. Get is one of the um, I post. See, it's one, there's also post. If I do a post, what I'm going to be doing is sending a, a dictionary. I'm going to give a give the, the the socket a dictionary to send, and 4D will parse it out as a form. I'm going to do a get at this point. Uh, I put the HTTP um, slash slash before the host address of local host. Then I give it a couple more keywords. Okay, chaos is something I inherited from David. Uh, every method that he created, everything that he did that had anything to do with the web app itself, when he was writing in Flex, he used the word chaos in the name, chaos whatever. Uh, I kind of adopted that, and it's a quick way for in 4D for me to see what the method is really for. So it's the, all, all those methods start with chaos. Also, the web it tells 4D when the, when the, when the request comes in that chaos it means that we need to handle this. It, it is a request for handling of a request, and 4D needs to handle it. Then this is the keyword, get contacts, that tells what it needs to do. So I put get contacts. Then I add the get field that I did here, my standard stuff that I want to send, and give it a 30-second timeout. And then when it comes back, I uh, do some encoding to make it more readable and this is for us to look at it when it comes back. Okay, this is a good time for us to look at 4D. Okay. First of all, in the 4D side, when you open up the, the demo, uh, I have two folders in the home page, uh, some miscellaneous stuff and some other stuff. But the main folder from David Adams uh, has these folders in it, web requests, web responses. Again, I treat these as black boxes, uh, not the web, I mean the web request, web response. We'll talk about a couple of these in a minute, but not much about them. Uh, pretty much I left this code alone and just let it do its thing. Uh, the two handlers that we need that I we're going to look at close more closely is the chaos contacts and the chaos web handler. This is the, the handler and this is the method that's going to take care of things. Okay, having said that, uh, obviously when uh, when a request comes in, the first place it's going to hit is web authentication. I have no code there. But uh, on web connection, this is what we're going to get. Now, it hits this method. Uh, I'm going to call this black box stuff all the way down to about here. This is all of 4D's or David's code. I added a couple of things in here possibly. But just as I got it from him uh, when I got the site, and I just copied this over and over again, to any new site, any new database. And basically what he's doing here is he's parsing out the, the, the URL string. And what he ends up with is a URL string that's everything, including the word chaos, where that would be in the URL string on. So if this method sees chaos, it runs the, the chaos web handler. Uh, because chaos tells it, hey, we need to handle this request. Uh, I left this in here to show you real quick if it sees, in this case, this is something I created, Zojo Demo. This would be, if you're having 4D, get the hit first. www.mycoolwebsite.com slant x Zojo Demo. That would go to 4D. And 4D would see Zojo Demo. And I've got it hard-coded here, but you can see what I'm doing. I'm doing a redirect to the, to the Zojo website, localhost 8080. Then Zojo takes over and starts up querying 4D. Uh, in the real world, what I do is I actually have a, a table that has the settings for the various uh, apps that might be there. In the, for example, I said earlier that I have three web apps going on. This is uh, in one of my uh, uh, deployments. This is how I handle it. Uh, each each entry here would tell it where to which app to redirect to. If none of these get hit, then uh, 4D assumes it's a file that's being looked for and starts looking for it on the disk. If it can't find the file that's that's there, or if it's just a junk call, it sends back an error message. So then, basically, let's go back here, because we have chaos in our return. If I click here, this is the method that handles the uh, the, 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 hand, the, uh, the, the request. Uh, again, I'm going to call this all black box down to here and not worry about it. What basically he's doing is uh, cleaning up some of the uh, any we call crawlers or things like that. 
and he's ending up giving us a URL text that eliminates the word chaos and leaves everything from the keyword down. So URL text get contacts is what we have. So it's going to call the chaos contacts method without any parameters. If you notice, I have a delete contact, save contact, and new contact. That's from the demo that you get for, for downloading. And it passes a, a, pa a parameter to take care of that. So let's look at that real quick. Uh, okay. Now I'm going to show you. Want to show you just before we jump a little further into this, the two requests to parse out what was sent. This command, web request get URL parameter. Again, a black box to me. I did tweak it a little bit to do some dot notation work with it. But uh, anyways, it's it's it, you can use it straight as it is. You don't have to look at it. Basically, it's taking the URL string and parsing out the different uh, portions of that. And in this case, I'm asking for what output is it requesting? And that, if it was XML, that would be here. If it was Java, uh, uh, what was, <laughs> my mind just went blank. <laughs> Anyways, you, uh, that's that's the way uh, to get to URL. Jason. I'm sorry? Jason. Jason, yeah, Jason. Um, this command here, again, the black box to me, web request get form field is if I were to have passed a form, uh, as which was a dictionary in Zojo, uh, it gets passed. This command then parses the fields that are in that form, full name, address, city, zips, ID. Okay, so those are the two ways you can parse out what's there. Again, black box, I'm not worried about how they does it, it just does it for me, it's great. But I'm not passing any parameters, so we're going to ignore that. In any case, no matter what happens, after I do a delete, a save, an edit, or whatever, I'm going to return all of the records uh, that are in the table. So I do an all records, and then I'm going to look and see, okay, if there are, are there any records? Uh, and if not, then it's going to drop all the way through. I didn't write any code to handle that, but that would do that here. Uh, and what kind of output does it want, XML or JSON? So if I go and open XML, basically, Again, this part right here, I'm calling black box because I never changed anything that David did. It doesn't have to be this way. You could probably write it a lot differently, but that works. And I've never changed it since 2011. It's been this way from the day he gave it to me. Uh, and then it creates an XML text. And go down to the bottom, it sends the text. It, he applies some header stuff to it, and then he has, we use the 4D command web send text with the XML text. Okay. If, on the other hand, it says JSON is the output it wants, this is something I just learned this week, actually, in doing this presentation. I never used it before. I create a JSON string, uh, basically by uh, creating a template in an object, a C object, um, and adding the uh, full name and, and address, line, city, safe, and so as properties of the object. Uh, I added an additional one to tell it what I'm sending back. I'm sending back JSON and not, because if you look at the XML up here, there's the word XML is here, so Zojo will know what, that that is XML. In this case, I have to add JSON to tell it that it is JSON. Uh, and then I do an all records, and then I just create a selection to JSON using that template that I just created up here, and I get a JSON string. And what do I do? I just web send it as a JSON string. That's all there is to it. So I'm going to close these up, and we're going to run it, hopefully, and put a, put a stop here and run it. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Okay, we're at a break. So I put a break in, and uh, we're in the event open, and I have a data variable that I want to look at. So in this case, I told it to give it to me in JSON. So in the get, you can see I have the word JSON there, and, and later I'll test that. But I just want to look at the data. So let's make this a little bit better. And you can see I've got JSON, uh, a JSON string with all the data in it. So let's stop that. And let's change the request to XML. 
run it. And this time I'm going to look at the data. And hey, work. I've got an XML. I can't make it any bigger. I don't think. I can see there's uh, an XML uh, text string with all of the stuff in it. Okay. All right. So we've got that's that's good. We've got it working. Uh, we're getting the data back. Now we need to handle the data that's coming back. This is. I'm not going to go through all of this code. Just part of it. Okay. Basically. Basically, what I'm doing at this point, is the handle of the request is I'm checking the data, the data coming back for a string that says XML. Uh, in this case, it's always going to be after a question mark at, at position two. Uh, and then I'll handle those XML in that section. Uh, if it says JSON, I'll handle it here. If it's not either one, then I need to handle an error. So let's see that real quick. I'm going to go back to 4D. And go to chaos contacts. And at the top here, I'm going to force an error. Somebody may have seen a post that I was having trouble with this. So what's going on? Okay, there we go. Test error equals test underscore error is going to throw an error because neither of these are variables that are that are declared or methods. So that should throw an error. So at this point, what's going to happen, data is going to, it's going to go out for the request, and 4D is going to encounter that error and hopefully send me back some information. Let's run. And, oh, I know. What did I not do? <laughs> uh, damn it. I always do this. I didn't update the, uh, to run it, or I have to save that project. That change that I made to that method. So now it's changed. Okay, let's try it again. <clears throat> there we go. So this is the data that was sent back, and I added some wording up here. And internal errors occurred. Uh, if you uh, please notify the webmaster at this. Right. Now for me as a developer, 4D has been real nice. It actually tells me what line number it hit, what method it's in. And I'm good to go. So I can go back. And the nice thing is, is that th that does not stop the, um, the web app. It continues to run. It, there's, it's, it's, the error was handled. So if I go back to Web Chaos Contacts, line number 20, and comment that back out again. And I got to save it. I don't can do it by going to the test application. That's what I didn't do before. And I go ahead and rerun, uh, just refresh this. It it worked without an error that time. I didn't get anything back. Okay. All right. All right. So we've handled it uh, to some extent. Now I'm going to change this back to to JSON because this is quicker to demo. In the section for, for if it's JSON, uh, what basically we're doing uh, is uh, getting rid of some the that word, uh, this entry that said JSON uh, in this section right here uh, and replacing the string. Uh, and then I'm dimming a, a, uh, a JSON array. And I, I'm not going to go into this, but it's dimmed as an auto, uh, but that go for now. Uh, so just basically, I have an array, and into that array, I'm going to call Zojo date, data parse JSON. And this takes the data uh, as a text and parses it out into a bunch to a di dictionary for each record that I've sent in the JSON text string, and puts that as an array of dictionaries. And then from there, it's uh, it's I, I need to, uh, because I'm, I'm sending directly from the database, I need to create the address line that I want uh, from the values that came in. So this is an iteration through that array uh, and grabbing the 
the dictionary that's there for each D as Zojo dictionary, Cure dictionary in the, in the JSON array. And so I get a dictionary in D and then I can do D value and get the field that's there. Address line, city, state, zip. That is all concatenated into address. Then for the list box, I just add a row for each dictionary. And I'm putting in the full name, CD, the D value full name, and the address I just concatenated. So what we should get back here, that hopefully, let's see if it works. Boom, worked. Okay, so, but that doesn't do anything right now. I'm going to close this back up. And uh, just for grins, I'm going to show you This will not work at this point. This is the XML because I need a reader. And I'm not going to build that reader. Uh, it, you actually have to create it. It's a class in Zojo for the, an XML reader, but you have to, it's not in the, in the library. You have to uh, actually instantiate that with code. Uh, but to uh, get that right now, I'm just going to copy it, paste it. I can't paste it from there. So I have an XML reader. I'm going to drag it down to right here. So that should work. The reader basically takes the XML and steps through it uh, piece by piece and uh, uh, creates a dictionary for me. Uh, so if I go back to my open, uh, that's I'm instantiating. I've got the reader instantiated as reader. I'm telling it to give it back to me in this response dictionary that I end up here. Uh, I'm telling it what the uh, keywords are and for details, what, uh, if you looked at the XML, starts contacts and then inside are each of the records with a contact tag. And then I parse it to here. Uh, so that's how that works. So if I run this, it should, whoops, it's still going to go into JSON. So let's close that. Did I change it? Did not, I don't think. So if I go back to open and I change this to XML. Okay, now it should run into XML and it'll drop into the XML section of my handler. Uh, if it says JSON, in this case, it'll say XML. So if I run it, <clears throat> Now, if I click on me, oh, it's not working. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I haven't done the next step. Anyways, it worked. <laughs> we got the XML back. Sorry, got ahead of myself. Okay, we need to do one more thing, and that is to put something in the uh, list box to make it fill the field and give, give us the spot. So I'm going to double click the list box and uh, again, a form event for selection change. Anytime I select the change. Okay. I'm going to copy the code for that. Okay. I don't want it to do anything if the list box is not at anything selected. So the list index is what row it's in. And uh, I'm going to say, Hey, if it's not minus one, then okay, I can go ahead and do something. Uh, and then you've seen this code before. So I'm basically dimming a web location, putting in the API key, and I'm putting in the address that is in the list box for the cell. And I tell it the cell for the particular list box row, and I want the address is in the second column, which is column one, because it's zero base. Uh, and I'm going to apply that location to the viewer. I'm also going to put it in the text field. So if we run this now, hopefully we'll get something to work. All right. So if I click on me, I'm in Hawaii. If I click on my sister, I'm in Seattle or north of Seattle up by uh, Oak Harbor. Uh, she lives in uh, Port An or Anyway, she lives up in that area. Uh, my brother, who lives in San Jose. And my aunt, who lives in... Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, um, Maria Angelica. All right, uh, so basically we've done it. We've created 
a web app that's functional actually does something for us. Okay. If you want, I can, uh, do I have time, Brent? Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah for, uh, for what? I'm going to show you a couple of my websites that, that are up. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's nice to see um, what can be done yeah. uh, outside of the demo. Real world examples. Real world examples. The first one I'm going to show you is running on a Windows machine. Uh, it's using the uh, Microsoft SQL Server as a proxy for the web app. 4D is running uh, on that server, uh, web server, it's, uh, and it's running in uh, V16R6, I believe. So put in the address. Launches. Okay. <clears throat> now, what we have here is Queens Hospital. The architect that I work with on this has digitized, uh, going back 100 years almost, uh, many years ago, all of the architectural drawings that were ever made for Queens into, and they've digitized them. Uh, we put them on uh, a, a server in PDF, PDF format. Uh, and it's all managed by a 4D database, which categorizes them uh, and uh, and knows where they are. And this this site talks back to 4D. I'm already logged in. I can. It's actually thrown a cookie to know who I am at this point. Uh, the web app throws the cookie for me. Uh, if I didn't throw a cookie, I'd have to log in with a username. I've also already logged in via the, the server itself. If it's the first time you've come in, the server is going to want to log in. Uh, the Windows server, uh, but uh, this is Zojo also needs a, a, a login, and that's managed by 4D. Uh, so it's all organized by organization, by project, by or by location, project, and then the drawing. So if I go to Queens Medical Center, which is downtown Honolulu, it looks to see what's available, and if there's only one site, it will pop to one site, but there's many sites, and so I'm going to go to the Punchbowl Campus, which is downtown Honolulu, and it tells me to select location. And these are all the locations. I'm going to go to the Harkness Building, which is the uh, facilities management folks, uh, which is who we work with. And these are all the projects that have uh, been done on that building. If you go see it, there's one project here from 1929. Uh, so these have all been digitized. It's just been a 10-year project getting this in. And, and we used a proprietary piece of software, which costs about $10,000 to do this before uh, they went out of business. And so this is the database that I built in two weeks. Or this is the website, web app that I built in two weeks. The database, actually I built the database and the web app in two weeks to do this. It shows you how quick, you know, 4D is quick. So is Zojo. And it was really, I built the prototype. There was some tweaking I had to do after, but that was good. Anyways, let's go get something here. I'm going to just go take uh, this dining room res restoration. And it lists all the drawings that were that were created for that project. If I click a drawing, I get the drawing. I can show full screen the drawing. And the database has information. They basically, they basically maintain a master spreadsheet that keeps all of the data about each of the drawings uh, in the spreadsheet. We use the spreadsheet then to upload into 4D to, uh, to, to tag all of these drawings with the information that goes along it. So if I click on the info button here, this is the information about the project, uh, the name, description, title, where it's located, the actual physical paper drawing is rule number one, box number 32, the year it was created, 1985, uh, and so forth, the information on that. If I click this for the drawing itself, this is information about the drawing. It's not, I didn't do a very good job of this. It shouldn't be scrolling. The name description, it also gives me the file size. This particular file size is 1.8 megabytes. This data is all coming from 4D. So uh, if I click another, 1.8 megabytes is pretty big. It takes a little while to get these under that big. 
Are you serving um, external links to the document? What is happening is the, the, the links are, are all on the hard drive, uh, or the, the documents are all on the hard drive in uh, an organized folder methodology that we've devised uh, <clears throat> for them to be able to handle them physically. But they're physically on the drive. 4D has a path to that drive, to that to each drawing. Gotcha. All I'm doing is uh, serving the PDF up to Zojo. Gotcha. So it's a PDF viewer. Right. This is a this is actually not a PDF viewer. It's Zojo's uh, web viewer. Ah. And it works pretty well. Uh, I didn't have to do much outside of. Uh, there are other viewers you can probably get and work with this. Uh, we can open this in preview from here. Uh, oh, nice. You know, it's 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 got it's got the preview because I'm using the preview plugin. Uh, you can zoom in here. You can put, go ahead and print to here from here. I believe no, you have to open it up to print in preview, uh, and you can download it. Um, so well, that's basically it. Uh, there's a full feature set for filtering, and this is instructions down here. And basically, you can search on any of the attributes that we that I've put on uh, either the project or the or the, the document itself. And there's instructions on how to use this, what wild cards, and so forth. There's also if you're I'm an administrator, and because I'm an administrator, I get this administration tab. And the administration tabs allowed me to manage what users can actually view these drawings. And these are the current users in the database. And uh, they all have unlimited access, but by selecting and creating basically the same thing as these pop downs, I can restrict what building or what floor uh, they can see. So you have a, a contractor comes in that's working on a particular building. We don't want, don't want this, them to see the whole campus. So we restrict them to that particular building and even that particular floor if we want to. And all they see are the drawings that are associated with the project that they're working on. Uh, and there were, they use this quite regularly. It, it really actually works pretty well. They replaced a $10,000 uh, application that was bought back uh, many years ago that no longer is usable. Okay, everybody got that one? Okay, I'm going to go to one more. And uh, let's go to judges. So this is the... Um, judges registration site. Pass.coe. This one is running a little bit differently. Okay. This one is the one I was telling you about that actually has 4D running as a as 4D is getting the initial hit and then redirecting to the web app. So if I click on this, you'll see that, hey, there's that port. And this is what's bad about doing it as a standalone, as opposed to what I just showed you with the Windows and using the proxy. We get away with this. It works. Uh, it's not the best way to do things, but it works for us. So this is basically uh, judges coming in. I'm going to click here, and I'm going to put in, I believe this is what I did. It gives me a welcome back. Now, what you're looking at here, you see these tabs? This is a major use of the subforms or the containers. This is one form. I have little buttons up here that uh, I uh, stylize to look like tab buttons. And when I click here, I'm basically hiding the container that belongs to this one. When I click here, I'm hiding the container, the other two, and showing this one. Okay, so this is where they would come in and edit their information. And when I click the edit conf information, it brings up a window. They're not pretty. Uh, I've got to say, I don't create pretty web apps. Uh, I just create use useful web apps, I hope. This is where they do their background. Uh, this is where they can, uh, can uh, put in what categories they want to judge in the, in the, in the site. 
And down here is, a again, another web area, and it shows uh, from the uh, ISIF, International Science and Engineering Fairs, which puts on by Intel, their uh, descriptions of what these categories are. And if I pick a description or pick a category, it jumps to that one. See, it's jumping to cellular and molecular chemistry and so on. Um, when I, in, in order to select, I did some funky stuff here where you click the buttons to move the selections around uh, between the three windows. There might be a better way to do this, but that's what I came up with. So you can see you're really pretty flexible about what you can do. Um, uh, Kokua is, means uh, to help in Hawaiian. Uh, and this gives them the ability to say, hey, I'm willing to, to judge si uh, the district fairs. These are, each district has their own fair, and I can mentor if you just tell you, I'll mentor in any of these districts if you want me to. Uh, I'm not going to do a review and confirm because I don't want to send a message out to this. To this. Uh, the last one is what the, they get to see. This is from this year's fair. Uh, once they're assigned projects, they're told to come back into the website and they can view the projects that they're assigned to judge. So if I select this project and click abstract, I get the student's abstract for that project. These are PDFs again that are uh, stored by 4D. The PDFs are actually uh, created by in text in the database and this PDF is created on the fly. Hmm. It's not stored elsewhere, it's created on the fly. So I take the text out of 4D and I have a form that has the other stuff on it uh, and all the information that they've checked in from the registration is checked on the form. So this and this project has been assigned a project number as a it's a junior research project number 418 in behavioral science. And this is the abstract that they typed into their registration. So the judge then gets to preview all of the projects that they're going to review. Uh, also give them the ability to look at a, a ranking form, and this is the way they, just to give them a preview of how they're going to uh, judge, uh, gives them some information on, on how, what, how to judge and instructions on how to actually look at this right here. Well, this is very impressive. That's it. Any questions? Very impressive. Let's go out and, and see if there's anything uh, on Reddit. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's really impressive to see how much can be done with, uh, you know, using 4D as an API backend and, uh, and to some extent outsourcing the, uh, the, the, uh, web page creation, uh, to other environments, uh, where you can just belt something out really quickly. Um, yeah, so let me just pop into, uh. Read it here and see if anybody asked a question. Um, haven't actually been monitoring the, uh, the YouTube page. Um, but yeah, I don't see anything there in particular. Does anybody in the Hangout have a. Yeah, uh, anybody a here? Did I just talk to the world? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we appreciate your job. <laughs> Okay, Brent, are you still there? Oh, had the uh, microphone off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I thought I'd um, uh, add another quote from another famous Bach man. Uh, it, it's easy to play any musical instrument or uh, coding language. All you have to do is touch the right key at the right time and the instrument will play itself. So. <laughs> It's uh, and that's uh, if you do it the right way, the simple way, you take take an an easier avenue with some of this stuff. Uh, it can really pay off in the long run. You you end up doing an app in two weeks rather than uh, you know, two years or in some cases, six years, as I've seen before in my own professional history. <laughs> Sometimes you just want it to work. Yep. Wanna, I forgot to show you the actual uh, full demo uh, thing just. I don't know if that matters. I'm going to run it real quick over here uh, and show you that what you're getting when you download, you have the three edit buttons. Uh, so you can select and I can edit. 
for today. And I can select, I can delete, I can add. And I save. So that's that's what you're getting all of the uh, functionality, right? Now and, and you know, we can ex extrapolate from there. Once once the uh, the interface is workable on the website, uh, you know, you can really leverage uh, 4D on the back end to uh, you know for the data access and for the business logic, and uh, and and have the display uh, uh, controller side, uh, on, you know, in, in the web environment. So. Really awesome, uh, very thorough demo, uh, worth uh, rewatching and working through for people in the, uh, in the demo code, which is available on uh, the 40 Method website. So download it. John's uh, put up the, um, the Zojo project, the 4D database, and you can uh, set this up and, and run it in the uh, comfort of your own home. Right, just download the Zojo, uh, you know, download Zojo from the Zojo site, and you should be able to run that project without any problem. Awesome. Um, just like to also mention that if uh, if you're new to Zojo, which which I was, uh, I watched a couple of uh, of their demo videos, uh, and, and that's also quite educational. Good material there to uh, to get you up and going to connect into your forty system. So, all right. Thanks again, John. Okay. Yep. Um, just a quick note about uh, our schedule. Schedule is available uh, on the 40 Method website under the Schedule tab. Um, on Wednesday, June 27th, uh, we have. Um, uh, let me just. Uh, oh, there we go. We got the got the mute. Getting a little echo there. Um, we've got some exciting demos coming up uh, in our next meetings. Um, uh, the June 27th is is actually a little bit in the air, uh, but currently we have uh, we'll we'll be getting more in depth information about uh, using 4D and AWS and how to set up AWS uh, so that you can uh, publish your your 4D APIs and and uh, applications through there from uh, Ballander Walia, uh, and then uh, we're also uh, we have penciled in to have Kirk Brooks show us. Uh, some of his new, uh, new approaches with form control uh, in V17 using the uh, subforms and uh, inherited forms and whatnot. So, um, yeah, a couple of uh, really powerful, uh, they, they both gave some powerful demonstrations at the 4D Summit, and they are looking to uh, go more in depth with uh, V17 and, and a deeper dive into AWS and in in those presentations. Um, we might also uh, have a surprise presenter uh, in, in one of our next meetings uh, that keep an eye out for that announcement uh, uh, in the upcoming post from 4D Method. Um, we have open dates on September 26th and November 7th. Reach out to us uh, with your ideas and we'll get you on the schedule. Until then, uh, just like to wrap up, if anyone's got uh, any other questions, uh, feedback is always appreciated. Let us know how, how, how to do things better, certainly. And, uh, if you're, uh, if you've got, uh, uh, the, the objective to, uh, to, uh, support us more, uh, you can always go to Patreon and see what kind of little, uh, perks that you can get for, uh, for pitching in there. So, uh, thanks so much and we'll see you online and we'll see you in the next uh, 40 method meeting. Thanks to 4D and, and uh, Ricardo for joining us as well. And thanks again for setting this up, Brent. Okay. All right. All right. We'll talk to you all soon. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye.